everybody. We got another special guest for you this week. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Richard Fairgray. How we doing, Richard? How you been since last we talked? I'm good. I like that I, I started off by just, just jumping in over top of you. Uh, <laughs> just real good podcast <laughs> etiquette. You can tell. Wow, just nailing it right off the bat. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's been wild six months. I'll say that. Yeah, we were talking a little bit before, but it sounds like it. Back in the States. Um, for for a little while, at least. I have um, escaped Canada. I'm back in Hollywood. I am hiding out in my office. I've been here for five weeks. Um, it's really, it's, it's like, I, 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 by the way, I'm super fresh on my last interview because I listened to it this morning to make sure I didn't repeat myself. <laughs> um, so I'm going to make a lot of, like, deep cut references to my appearance from September last year, and everyone's going to totally be able to follow. Pretty great. <laughs> well, yeah, now that you're back in uh, Hollyweird, everybody wants to know any uh, good side quests while you're there, or you just been hanging out in the office? Um, well, I was actually, I've been thinking about this recently. I was worried that my life was becoming really boring um, because of living in Canada and because of quarantine and all of that. And then on Thursday, I got an email from a guy who I had a conversation with on the internet maybe seven years ago. And like a casual, normal conversation in which I mentioned that my eventual goal was to freeze to death because okay. I really like being cold. And like, if I'm going to go out, I want it to be like that. Right. And there was, you know, there's a plan in place. Like I will go into a, into a grocery store, into their beer fridge. I'll build myself a little fortress. I'll take off all my clothes and I'll like drink until I fall asleep. And this is not a thing I'm planning for the near future. This is like when I'm crazy, old, like 200, okay. but it's my plan. Anyway, so he remembered this, remembered my name, tracked down my email address and sent me a message saying, Hey Richard, um, you know, I think I've only got maybe one or two years left to live and it really stuck with me what you said. And I figure why not just spend my money on the things that I really want to see? Would you be willing to come to Florida for two weeks and have experiments done on you to see how cold you can get without dying? I'll give you half a million dollars. Okay. So I'm mean, gonna said no, but <laughs> like, and I, I think that's a good one because like, if I get nerve damage in my fingers, I'm screwed. I can't draw. So I'm making good, good choices with boundaries. But still, it was nice that it, like, it was nice to get the offer. You know, <laughs> half a million dollars. That's a, that's a lot of money. This this guy. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna reveal his real name because I think that would be overstepping things. But like. Back when we first talked, they did some research into him, and he was, like, at the time, remarrying a Rockefeller for the third time. And he was asking me to, um, he was going to be going to New Zealand, and he knew that I lived there at the time, so he was asking if I could help him find a place to rent a red convertible to drive around the country in. When I couldn't, um, he just bought one instead. And then we were meant to meet up and meet in person when I was in New Zealand. He was there. It was his, his third honeymoon to this person. And um, and I was out of the country at the time, and we only had a two-day crossover when I got back. And, I, and I, was, I was going to a convention. He was flying out from the same city the convention was in, and I was staying at my friend's place up on a mountain. And um, we're on our way to the convention. I cannot turn around. I cannot go back. I've got to go sell books and do all the, you know, do the, 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 the monkey dance that gets the books out there. And I get a message... Richard, I'm so disappointed in you that we weren't able to meet, but I value your friendship, and so I'm giving you my car because I will not need it anymore. It is in the parking lot of the subway at the base of Mount Pleasant. The papers are in it, and the keys are in the ignition. I hope you enjoy it. I'm like, well, okay, I can't drive, and also that's insane. <laughs> and obviously, I'm at a convention. What am I meant to do? And like, by the time I got there, of course, the car was gone. Yeah. But still, he did offer me half a million dollars to not necessarily freeze me to death. <laughs> so I, I just, I feel good. I feel like I'm having, I, I, I was on my way back from getting some chicken last night. And, uh, like, like a meal, not just like some, not just a quantity of chicken. Although I did just buy six pounds of chicken this morning. Uh, but on my way back from getting a chicken dinner last night, and, uh, this, this guy was, like, leaning on my gate, and, um... And I asked if it was okay, and he just said he just needed 
a bit of a risk because he had hit, uh, got off the wrong bus stop and had to walk the wrong way, was retired. And I think he should get some water, hinting to go to the Seven Eleven across the street. He said, I just need to sit down. So I brought him to my office with me. And he, 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 fell, he, fell, he fell up the stairs and he knee and I helped him back then. We are talking for maybe 20 minutes while he took a rest, and I found out that... And by the way, this is Sunset Boulevard, one of the largest cities in the country, like, the, 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 you know, the, the, the hundreds of millions of people who could be here. And I started talking to this one potentially insane person who then reveals to me that they dated the same person in New Zealand at the same time. Because there are only 25 people in the entire world, apparently. <laughs> that... I don't even know what the chances are of that. It's very confusing. That's, that's, we're getting together for coffee later today so we can like discuss this person in, in great detail because they were terrible. I mean, you got to, right? Like, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's good to know that even in a quarantine world, you're still having some adventure. I'm, I'm happy for you there. Well, I'm, I'm, I've got to be honest. Like, I have not had uh, any adventure <laughs> I'm fully vaccinated and I'm just like leaning in for like the second that I crossed that like two week ding, ding, ding threshold, I was on a plane heading to New York, got straight on a subway and was like, these poles are never going to be cleaner than they are right now. I like I don't want to lick it, but I feel like I have to. And my friends stopped me, um, which I resent them for a little bit. And I will say too, I live in a part of the of New York that where you say you went out to get some chicken, you could have literally come home with live chickens, and it wouldn't have shocked me too much. <laughs> I know people are just like, yeah, I have chickens in the backyard. Like, oh, what? <laughs> Oh, see, I just found out my friend's sister, who I knew had chickens, but I just found out that the chickens live in the house with them. And I don't know how to deal with that. I have an uncle who has an open door policy, um, and he literally, you go over to his house, and he'll just have, like, skunks, raccoons, name it, just walking through the door. You just sit there talking to him, and all of a sudden, Ooh. there's a raccoon. It's like, uh, what? <laughs> he sounds like the uncle I don't want to meet. <laughs> This is so. <laughs> this is my fun little COVID story. We, my dad went over to talk with him because he this he hasn't been doing so hot, and uh, he asked him. He goes because this uncle like he grows. He lives in a hill, and the nearest person's like two miles away. And he grows weed in his backyard. My dad's like, well, it's legal now. What do you think of it? And as if he was a twenty-one-year-old kid who just was able to legally buy a beer. He goes, well, now it's legal. It's not fun anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got an email from my um, my immigration lawyer just letting me know. And, like, I I have smoked weed in my life, but, like, I, it's it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a drinker. Um, but I got this email from my lawyer saying, like, Richard, remember... All of the legalized weed laws in the U.S. are state laws, not federal laws. You are an immigrant. It is still illegal for you to smoke weed. And I think that's wild. Like, that sucks. That is, like, a law designed to punish. Like, let's be honest. Of, of, of immigrants, I'm not the person who's going to get stopped by the cops for smoking weed. Mm -hmm. It's a law designed to punish people who are not white. It, so... It I won't give away too much of my uh, day job stuff, but because of my day job and what I do, it's actually still illegal for me. So if I tested positive, which I could be randomly drug tested any day, I could still be fired. Huh. And I don't even have, like, a very important job. <laughs> so, you just dust the big uh, red. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, how those laws are made, it's weird. I... It's weird, but, but all right. So uh, <laughs> that, we got off topic. I do want, can I, can I, before we get on topic, I want to okay. say, I was listening to, uh, so I've been alone in this office. Everyone else moved out of the building when COVID hit and, and like they haven't come back. And I've been alone in this building for the five weeks that I've been hiding out here. And, uh, I've gotten very used to like talking to myself and yelling a little bit. Mm -hmm. And today for the first time, the people in the office next door have come back. Which is fine, except that I was in the bathroom doing my business, just in some solid, like, vitamins while doing its work, and I'm listening to my episode of this podcast from last year, and after my interview, you guys were talking about the, uh, 
dark, <laughs> dark universe, like DC stuff that was coming out. Oh, it does you matter. Talking about, you know, yeah, yeah, and but you were saying like which ones you'd want, and you said you wanted like a dark universe interpretation of uh, like something, something uh, from Earth Two with like Batman and Owlman, and you said yes, yeah, and you said Batman and Owlman, and I yelled. Bell man, <laughs> um, just as someone walked past the bathroom door, and said, uh, they don't like me anyway because I am mean to them. So that's a good thing for the first day back, you know. That's been one lucky thing for me is uh, my my job didn't stop. You know, I still have my girlfriend I live with. I've still been around people this whole time, so I feel for anybody that was kind of stuck alone or. Even just quarantining at all during this, <laughs> I couldn't imagine it. I went but. crazy. I went like I was with my husband mm -hmm. the whole time, but um, I had so you know I get joy from a lot of things. Like I'm essentially a dog. I no matter how bad something is, you can be like, "Hey, Richard, there's a slide to play on." I'm like, "Yeah, back on top." And a lot of those joys got taken away. I haven't been on a slide for over a year. Um, I. I was really relying on like food and tasty drinks, and then I decided to diet. And so I was being real healthy, and I was two days into this, and I ate, I don't know, let's say nothing but carrots for six meals in a row, and my entire body was like, we don't know what this is. <laughs> and I ruptured my bowel from undiagnosed diverticulitis from all the unprocessable fiber of carrots. And so it kept working for a day and a half in, like, excruciating pain until I passed out. And then my husband was like, we're taking you to the emergency room because you're going to die. So go there. They figure it all out. They do put an IV in my arm wrong twice and, like, mess up my arm. I got, like, weird. They, they kept putting it into my upper arm, and I have this tattoo of myself on my arm. And, like, it looked like I had my tattoo had two black eyes. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, then I couldn't. I had to be on these antibiotics to make sure that all the poop that had leaked into my blood didn't kill me. So for a month, I was not allowed to eat anything nice or have any alcohol. And so suddenly, the only two joys I had left in my slide-free world were just gone. And I was between projects on work, so I wasn't, like, obsessed with anything to distract me. And I started losing my mind. And right at, like, the three-week mark, I get this email from the Google Play Store letting me know there is a new Crash Bandicoot game. I don't particularly care about this normally, except the subject line for the email said, Richard, your best friend is back. And I got so overwhelmed that now, canonically, Crash Bandicoot and I are best friends, that I bought myself a television and a PlayStation and every single Crash Bandicoot game that's ever been made, and spent $2,000 in an hour and a half, which, frankly, I couldn't really afford to do. And then I had a 75-inch television and all these Crash Bandicoot games, and I started playing them and realized that I'm, I don't like video games and that this was a horrible mistake. And then I spent the rest of my time on these antibiotics, just like very de determinedly being like, I have to save the universe from Dr. Nefarious Trophy and his evil schemes along with his fun friend Neocortex. I don't see why anyone's interrupting me to do things like sleep or feed my dogs. I just hate video games and I don't know what I was doing, but anyway, so that was how I lost my mind. <laughs> now I'm stuck with this giant TV that I feel like I can't get rid of because it costs $278 for a 75-inch screen. And, like, I know that sounds very cheap, and it, it legitimately is. Mm -hmm. And $278 is not an expensive television or a lot of money. But when I was 8 years old and I saved up for my first television, it also cost $278. And it was a 13-inch screen. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm going to have this for the rest of my life. This is an important piece of furniture. And so I still had the same mindset. And now I'm like, I'm trapped. I'm trapped by my giant TV that's taken over one of my drawing desk and crash bandicoot his friendship and his wallet chain <laughs> there's, just, there's a good story in there somewhere of crash bandicoot tricking you into friendship <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 of all the video game characters like he's like i can't imagine bumping into a person who's like hey i have a giant upper body and don't wear a shirt check out my wallet chain and converse want to be buds like, no i don't i absolutely mm. don't i like to smash boxes well cool do that elsewhere i'm not your best friend <laughs> like let me hang out with Morik and his quest to find enough money in that grandpa's mansion to win his girlfriend back there's a deep cut joke for anyone who remembers mm. Morik, the game what? that no one has a result for on google but i'm sure i didn't dream of. <laughs> yeah when Crash came out, it was the 90s. Things were weird. Wallet chains were very in. They were. I'm pretty sure I had a couple in my life. 
I gotta admit, like, right before this podcast start recording started, like, I'm wearing some jorts now that I made for myself out of a pair of jorts, um, which is the word for long jorts, and, uh, I had changed, uh, there's, there's no other word for them, I'm not sure what, why you're laughing, but, um, I was wearing these real dope pants that have a lot of buckles and straps between them, and they're purple, and they're plaid, and they rule. And I was wearing this rhinestone Elvis jacket, and I was like, why is my microphone picking up so much noise? So now I'm stripped down to, like, t-shirt and jorts, and I'm, like, living that dope life, doing the podcast well, super profesh. <laughs> Let's talk about comics. How's it been? How's life? <laughs> well, it's pretty good, but uh, it, you've been busy in the meantime through all this adventure and whatnot. Um, you got a new comic yeah, coming out this it. summer. Oh the, no, the comic is. I mean, I've got I've got another one coming out in a couple of months, but the new one, the new Black Sand Beach, is already out. So we're on book two. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna like do a thing my publisher has asked me not to do. Original title, so good, but it got changed because of COVID because it was too scary. But I'm just gonna say it. It's called "Do You Remember How to Breathe?" Because <laughs> oh, the entire geez. premise of the story is about these kids who are dead, not because they died, but because they forgot how to be alive. And our main character teaches them how to breathe again and brings them back and oh it gets spooky um but now it's called do you remember the summer before or as i like to call it black sand beach i will always know what you did last summer the greatest trilogy of all time um i don't call it that it's <laughs> black sand beach do you remember the summer before it is follow-up to are you afraid of the light it is further adventures of dash and all his fun friends and uh Dealing with the ghosts and monsters of Black Sand Beach with cool flashbacks and, and other neat, creepy things happening. So remind everybody out there, what was uh, Black Sand Beach all about? So it's about a 12-year-old boy named Dash and his best friend Lily, and they are spending the summer with Dash's weird cousins at a uh, beach house at Black Sand Beach, the beach on the edge of darkness. Literally the very edge of the world where the line between our dimension and a creepy dimension of darkness is slowly being corroded away. And all kinds of creepy stuff is coming through. Dash uh, seems thinks he hasn't been there for six years. And at the end of book one, he finds his journal that reveals he was there last summer and can't remember it. And so this book is about... Um, they start reading the journal to find out what happened. And this sheep that has died several times... Everyone has a story about how they saw Ramses die. Uh, the sheep charges through, grabs the journal, and runs away with it. And they follow the sheep into the woods, which are never meant to go into at night, to find the pieces of the journal as they fall from the sheep's mouth, covered in, like, you know, sheep mouth goo. Uh, and they read little pieces and put the story together of his previous summer there. Um, and basically, he met two girls, they became friends, he realized they never ever left the woods, and that they cannot touch him. And it's because they are ghosts who live in the dimension of darkness, and... Gets, I'm, I'm not going to give away too much, but there's, like, one of the creepiest monsters I've ever come up with uh, is in this book. And I'm, the, 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 the whole theme of it is, like, can you, trust, can you trust a monster when it's helpless? Because is it being nice to you because it needs your help, or is it being nice to you because it's changed its ways? And it, I, I, I do a lot of things to mess with the kids and mess with their sense of self in the story. I'm very, very proud of it. That's that's awesome, man. Uh, you said the book's already out. Yeah, uh, it came out a few weeks ago. Um, so it's in. It's available through Diamond, so you can get it at any comic store. Um, but you know, it's 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 that phone book that is Diamond, so it'll be buried somewhere in the back of the other publishers section. Um, but it's yeah. available also in any bookstore, Amazon, Bookshop.org. You can. There's a link to it through the Holiday House and Pixel Inc. website. All of that stuff. Awesome. And. Uh, when did you start doing the, the Tales from Black Sand Beach podcast? Oh, that was, um, I think I finished that uh, by the time I spoke to you guys last time. Um, we just, we did it, it was right at the beginning of COVID when um, I was living at a recording studio um, and there was my, my roommate who's a musician, he was like, there's no work coming in, I'm bored, I've just built this studio in your backyard, Richard. Um, <laughs> do you want to use it for anything? I was like, yeah, let's do like a bunch of short, scary stories. And I worked with um, my friend Joe Slepsky and uh, Rebecca Wallenzak Slepsky, and we put together like these this six six episode thing. Alex Burke produced it all, um, and it's it's just it's the premise is that I, as myself, after a night of like old eating old buffalo wings, um, 
woke up in a, at a haunted lighthouse amongst every single thing I'd ever owned, uh, as well as a box of old cassette tapes with um, story, like, like dictaphone tapes uh, with stories from this reporter who had been trapped at Black Sand Beach. And we listen through the tapes and hear the stories and with a little bit of analysis they're not really wrong. And they're 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 they're, they're scary, scary, but they're so ridiculous. So there's this like balance for, for, for kids and adults of being creeped out by something that really shouldn't be that scary for you. And I can relate to uh waking up after eating a whole bunch of of chicken wings. That's it's definitely a part of my lexicon as well. Uh <laughs> Hey, can I ask you a question? Because you're an American. Sure. Why Why is Buffalo Wild Wings sometimes referred to as BW3? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Someone told me that it was, it was B and three W's, but they didn't know what the... Like, it's wild, I guess, wings, and then there was something else. that I can't possibly imagine what else they had on there. But, I mean, maybe it's like that weird thing where they'll just change the name of something to match their branding, like how Pizza Hut calls a calzone a pizzone. Yeah, I'm trying to think what the third W would be. The only thing that comes to mind is Westawatt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, uh, my, 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 friend, my friend Chris made, uh, made the, best, uh, the best joke like a couple of years ago when there was a the straight pride parade happening and that was a said, thing um, <laughs> it was a thing and he just he just wrote uh, by definition uh every every walk to a buffalo wild wings is a straight pride parade. <laughs> <laughs> he's not wrong see the, the thing is is i live near buffalo new york and i i probably been to a buffalo wild wings once in my life because it was legitimately a big story up here when there was a chicken wing shortage because every restaurant you go to up here sells chicken wings. So <laughs> we all have like our own little private places. We go to get uh, chicken wings. I had, um, so Buffalo sauce is not a thing in New Zealand. And, um, when I first came to America, I tried Buffalo wings for the first time and I was like, well, this is life changing. And so then I ate them every single day that I was here for seven weeks. And there's this thing about eating buffalo wild uh, buffalo wings uh, is that. And by the way, I've been to Buffalo Wild Wings a grand total of three times in my life, and all of them were what I would call mistakes. Um, but uh, I I was eating buffalo wings every day, and what I discovered was that if you eat buffalo wings and you're a gross person, later on you'll quite often find there's like some wing sauce on your phone screen from where you've been touching your phone while you're eating. And if no one's looking, you can do some sneaky licks and get that good flavor again. <laughs> so I was enjoying this this fun adventure. And then um, I went back to New Zealand, and I was just so used to licking my phone all the time that I forgot one day that I hadn't had any buffalo sauce, and I'd just been doing laundry, and I had some uh, some laundry detergent on my phone screen, and I got this real bad burn on my tongue. And my tongue just went really hard and turned white, but I had a convention the next day. And so I had to, the only thing that would make me be able to even move my tongue was I had to just put a bunch of salt in my mouth and then rinse it with water and just like shake it all around. And it would give me like 20 minutes of tongue movement. And so all day long, I was just eating handfuls of salt and, and gargling water at my table. And I did not get great sales. So there's a lesson. So I just looked it up on the, the world's leading expert, Wikipedia. Um, Buffalo Wild Wings was originally called Buffalo Wild Wings and Weck. I don't know what Weck is, but what that is, is, what is it's W-E-C-K. And uh, that is why it is referred to as BW3. Is there a link to the word Weck? No. Or is this one of these things where like, we're gonna, it's going to be like a lemon party situation where the listeners don't want to know what Weck is? I don't know, we're gonna figure, listen, we figure things out. What the, what is Weck in Buffalo Wild Wings? First thing on there. The, I like the, to imagine that you just typed what is, and the first result <laughs> was Weck in Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, the restaurant chain was originally named Buffalo Wild Wings and Weck. Beef on Weck is a popular sandwich in New York. That's not true. Um, consisting of roast beef on an au jus soaked 
two more whack roll. Okay. That sounds delicious, I'm not gonna lie, but... It does, but were they serving wings on top of that? Because I don't know if wings are a sandwich <laughs> food. This is Although, good. I mean, I also didn't think I could buy a microwavable frozen Philly cheesesteak, and I did that this morning. So, check back with me in an hour and a half and see how it's sitting. So, unfortunately, Buffalo Wild Wings no longer sells the Weck sandwich, but they do sell pocket pizzas, which is an intriguing idea. That's uh, a good way to ruin the chance. We're <laughs> Can we start a, a straight pride parade where all our signs say bring back Weck? <laughs> I, I can set that up. I can call the the League of Straight call Straight the Guys. Call <laughs> all the single dads who are heading to Buffalo Wild Wings this weekend. I'm amazed by the idea of a straight pride parade. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> Listen, I once I once had a, a boss um, tell me I, I just finished writing a I was doing a memoir, um, and uh, I just finished the second or third chapter and you know like it was it was just a story it was stories about my life but some of them did involve some homosexual activities okay. like it's not it's not a, a you know it's not really an, i mean it's an adult comic but it's not a pornographic comic or anything it's just like it was about you know me dating a guy and my boss at the time said i don't understand why gay people feel the need to just shove this stuff in our face all the time straight people don't do that and i was like but Right now, we're having a business meeting at a strip club called Plan B. Do you understand what you're saying to me? Because, like, you're you're like literally you're my boss for an all ages comic book, and this is where you decided we had to have our business meeting, and you're telling me that I rub homosexuality in your face, you crazy person. I had I had a a, a moment like a year ago. Have you seen that show Lovecraft County or country? No, not yet. So there's a no. there's a scene in there, and it's a very like in your face gay sex scene. And mm -hmm. I I watched it, and I was just like, it seems a little over the top. And that was my first reaction to it, and then I started like looking into like like what other media or what other shows have done, blah blah. And as I'm watching like other sex scenes from different shows, straight and otherwise, I'm just like. It wasn't really that over the top. I just had a weird reaction to that. That I is probably not what what was intended by the creator. But <laughs> it's like, well, it probably was intended by the creator. I mean, the, like the truth is, like any sex scene is going to be confrontational to a person who does not view that as their kind of sex scene. Any romance mm -hmm. scene is going to, you know, it's the same reason that like ten years ago, if you heard that someone was having a gay wedding, your first reaction was, aww. But your first reaction to a straight wedding was, oh, Jesus Christ, I have to go to a wedding? Because, <laughs> like, it was so much more special yep. that someone was getting gay married than straight married because it was new. Um, and I, I'm very, I'm really glad that I got married before that wore off because everyone was thrilled to come to my wedding rather than annoyed at me for having <laughs> um, But it has far worn off now, and I don't want anyone else to have any weddings ever unless I get to go, like, somewhere cool for it, like a slide park ideas for all my friends um I, mean, I miss slides so much you have no idea like just oh, best feeling in the world and everyone's always like go to this cool water slide i'm like no thank you no i don't want to get wet to go on a slide i just want to have my fun and leave anyway that's not the point the, the point is that like like i'm sure that like if you're putting gay sex scenes into television at this point it's still it, it has to be designed to be shocking because like it because of the fact that there's so little of it means that it still is going to be. Well, it's everything from how it was shot and the actual, like, act that the, the, the men were doing mm -hmm. it really wasn't as over the top as it was in my head at that moment. Because when I went back and watched other sex scenes, I'm just like, it's kind of, it's the same thing. Like, it was a, a it, it was an eye-opening moment for me personally. I, I was glad that I had that moment. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's like you know there was all of this um, all this upset off the over the uh, Montero uh, music video, which is it is what it is. It's fine. It's a good <laughs> music video, but it's like a really, 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 really tamed down version of the Rub music video by Peaches that came out like four years ago. 
and that it is one of the most extreme music videos I've ever seen in my life, and it really does a lot of things. And what's fascinating about it is, is it's very, very rapid, but never in a way that feels like it gets the journey. It, it doesn't feel like it's from one of the ways. It's, it's, I've, I've watched it with a number of different people, and a lot of straight men are like, I don't understand why I'm seeing naked bits, but I don't feel comfortable with it. Um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing to, to analyze. And, and, and yeah, but then, then you get, and, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's all, almost all uh, lesbian stuff in the video. And then you have the Montero video, which is overtly gay. Uh, without being that rapid, and it's publicly considered to be the like, shocking gun that is banned from the internet or whatever, if it can actually happen. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange world we live in. But but anyway, let's get back to talking about comics, because again, yeah. Richard's on here, so he got distracted by things. Yeah, so uh, I noticed here also you've got another book you're working on, uh, Cardboardia. Yes, um, so this is another all-ages book from Pixel and Ink um, that I am co-writing with Lucy Campagnolo, who is uh, a, a terrifically talented writer and uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world. And it is about four kids uh, from Queens, New York, who uh, on one morning they all get tokens in their breakfast cereal. And it makes no sense because they all eat different cereals from different manufacturers, but what happens, happens. And then they discover that they can travel through cardboard boxes into a world made of organic living cardboard. Every single thing, including the sky, the water, all of it is made of cardboard in an inexplicable way. And uh, they find out that there is a prophecy on a board game box that has a picture of them from long before they were born that says that they are the four people who can save the cardboard from the evil Great Queen. And it's it's we're 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 plotting out this epic uh, adventure, uh, which I like to think of as low budget fantasy, because while it is a whole new world we're building, it's a world that any kid can create with an empty cardboard box, and that's like really exciting to me. I was gonna say um, when you the... oh. sorry no no you go you go. I was gonna say when you're first describing, I'm just like it brings me back to being a child and just like. The two hundred and seventy dollar TV you're talking about when my dad got our TV and I just got this giant cardboard box to play with on the side, <laughs> create little spaceships or whatever. Like, like I'm, you don't have any kids, do you? Step kids, yes. Step kids, okay. Can can you imagine? Like, do you, do you know what it feels like to spend a lot of money on something and the kids want to play with the box? I don't have kids. I I would be so mad. Like, I get annoyed when I buy my dog a nice thing and they want to play with the packaging. I cannot imagine if it had been a TV or a fridge. I guess a fridge isn't really fun for playing with. We haven't had that moment, but uh, as you said with the dog, I've had that with cats, where I bought them a nice tree with, like, things from the sit-in scratch, and then they just go over the box and tear that to pieces. <laughs> I, I literally, like, I bought my dog some very fancy dog treats. I don't know why. I was just like, I just, I should do this nice thing for my dog. I'm sure they'll care. And there was, and I was like, I, I, I actually explained it out loud. I was like, okay, here, you know, my, my dog's name is uh, Michael. The situation Sorrentino. I call him, call her Sitch for short. I said, here you go, Sitch. And I explained to her what the flavor palette would be as it said on the box. <laughs> and I held it out to her, and she looked at it, and they just walked over and ate my other dog's poop. I was like, okay, though, come on, like, you could have just walked away, like, you feel like you're really, you're making a point here, and it's aggressive. That's, that's, but anyway, the book. Yeah, but the Cardboardia. <laughs> so, um, the, the, the thing about Cardboardia, which I, like, I'm, I'm really, that keeps me interested in it, because I like real-world adventures. Um, there are so many stories, like, um, that are, you know, that are perfectly good, good stories, stories I enjoy, things like, you know, Digimon or Narnia or, or you know, Harry Potter, these, you know, these, I, I don't like Harry Potter, That's so that was a dumb one to mention, but it is a story that does this. Kids go to a magical place, mm -hmm. and then they stay there, and they do their thing in that place, and all the adventures happen there, and then they come back to the real world or the normal world, and it's just like straight up boring everyday life until they go back to magic place. And, I mean, Digimon literally opens with them, like, wandering outside of me, like, where are we? I guess this world is digital. Look, some new friends. Let's fight a monster. 
and it's fine, and then they're there for like 400 episodes or whatever it is, and and, 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 and like, they go back to the real world and then I want to know what happened in the real world. I think that's why that first, the Billy Piper season of Doctor Who is so good, because so much of the stuff going back to the home and like seeing the fallout from her disappearing in time. Mm -hmm. um, so these kids, their power isn't to do something amazing in Cardboardia. I mean, there is some cool stuff with that as well, don't get me wrong. The Cardboardia, the, the Cardboard has big adventures in it. But the thing that makes these kids different than other kids is they can travel between the real world and the Cardboard through these boxes. It's the travel that's exciting. So they can go into a box in one place and come out of a box in a different place and then jump into a box right next, next to that box and come out in a totally different place if the equivalent box is somewhere else in the world. And that's really cool. So we get to do this fantasy story that 50% of it is a big adventure still taking place in the real world, and specifically in New York, which I really like because I love New York a lot. So they got almost a, a Mirror Master kind of ability, except with cardboard boxes. Yes, it, with the, so I chose the least reflective surface I could, <laughs> so that no one noticed, but thank you, you destroyed it. <laughs> No, they can, like, I mean, the, the world of cardboard is, like, you know, there are, there are, there are people, there are plants, there are buildings, it's, it's a world, like, fueled by creative potential energy, where physics works differently than it does here, and there's a whole society of cardboard people within it. It's just that these kids are the ones who can, like, live there or live here, and, um, the, and, like, it's very specifically designed so the adventure is happening on both sides. They cannot come home for safety or to take a break. Yeah, it's, I love the idea. Like it, like I said, for for me, you know, growing up and having these times where I would get a cardboard box and I'd be in space or whatever. And I think it's something that most people, especially kids, can really attached to it. So it's a cool little world you've created here. I mean, I'm sure that my publisher will get very mad at me when oh. I realize that I've just designed something that there's no need to buy merchandise for. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, bro you broke the first rule, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I just got sick of people being like, how is this toyetic? And I'd be like, how do you keep saying that word and not stabbing yourself in the throat? <laughs> you must have a magic skill. Isn't that how comics are made? We we need to make this toy, make it make sense. I mean, I got a Ron the Space Knight right here. <laughs> I just four years ago, I went out for dinner with a friend of a friend, and he started telling me all about how I'd done every single thing in my life wrong um, because if I wanted, like, he's like, if you want to have a TV show you need to start at the bottom and like learn how to do storyboards. I was like, I'm just going to sit and listen to this. Cause the truth is I don't want to have a TV show. Like I'm fine. To, if someone like finds my comics and says, Oh, this is pretty cool. Here's some money. I'm going to make a TV with it. I'll say, fine. When, no, they're not going to make a TV with it, Richard. That's not how words work. They're going to make a TV show with it. I'll say, that's fine. Do it. I will write you all the stories you want. But I love comic books. I start like I didn't start making comic books so that I could make something else later. I started making comic books so that I could make comic books. But this guy was telling me all about like you have to make things that follow these rules. This is the formula for success. This is how you design a toy that will be marketable to children. And I was like, this all feels exploitative. This is like I mean it's not as evil as say like a website that is designed to trick old people into giving their credit card numbers so they can get help to fix their printer. Mm -hmm. But it's it's pretty similar. Like it's it's a gross abuse of like we know how to get your money from you. We're gonna make you think you're getting a thing you want. And I don't mind selling things. I love selling things. But I don't want to sell something to someone who doesn't really want it. Because I want them to like I once bought a a, a, a Megazord uh, toy. And it was a knockoff Megazord, but it was from a toy store. Was, I was I was eight years old, and I thought that I was getting like I had the big Megazord, um, and this was a little one, and it said on the box "Remote Control Megazord." I was like, "Well, that's quite exciting. I'd love a remote control Megazord." And I paid sixty-seven dollars for it, 
And it wasn't a remote control Megazord. It was a crappy knockoff Megazord with no moving parts that couldn't be taken apart or transformed into dinosaurs. It, it did nothing. And I, I kept it, and I kept the box, and I kept, like, the bed every three or four months. I remember I would, like, go into my closet and take out this toy, but I, I hid because I was ashamed of myself for being stupid enough to buy it. And I hid it in the closet, and I would take it out, and I would look at the box again and try and find some other place that I something I'd miss, something that would tell me how to, like, find the remote control that definitely was not the box, or, like, find how to turn on this toy so I could do this thing that I promised. And, like, owning it filled me with shame, and that sucked. And, like, I know we all buy things we don't like, and we take a chance, and, oh, I, I bought this comic book, it turned out not to be very good, whatever. But, I don't want to be the person who's ever tricking someone into liking something because it's meant to be... It's just because it's meant to be good, whether it is or not. I, I don't want to make a toy and then write a comic to sell that toy. If there are, if there are things in my comics that can turn into toys, like there's in, you know, Black Sand 1, there's um, the Definitely Not Cows, these bipedal green horses with turtle hands and things extended bellies and mouths across them. And then I have made four of those. Um, as plush toys for myself, I just really wanted to own a physical embodiment of that. I used my uh, my husband's old dentures to make them out. Um, they'll, they'll be valuable when I'm dead. Uh, and I, I love having that. I would love to be able to like mass produce those, or like you know, make even even if I make them without dentures and just sold them at conventions or something. Like that's cool. But making a toy and then writing a comic to justify the existence of your toy to make people think they want it just feels icky. So this, if you have a cardboard box and an imagination, you could read this book, which is a really good book. You could read the book and enjoy it and then have your fun adventures. Don't go buy a special box just for it. <laughs> so I won't be seeing you at the next con with just a stack of cardboard boxes you're signing? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've, I've done some dumb things to... Um, <laughs> You know, like, it's a, it's the strange balance as well, though, because, like, as, a, as an independent creator, like, if I were, if I were at, you know, if I was, like, at a big boy comic company, which I don't want to be at, again, like, one of the things I always get asked is, like, what would you do if you wrote Batman? I'd be like, I don't know, find a different job. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I want to write my own stuff. And, like, no, 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 no tea, no shade on people who want to write Batman, or, like, because he's a cool character. I just have no stories for him, and I'd be like, I'd do that quite badly. It's like, what, what would you do if you wrote a Superman story? I don't know, fail. <laughs> um, but I do, like, as an independent creator, I've done all kinds of things. Like, I had a prize wheel at my, at my booth, and you'd pay 50 cents, and you'd win a, you know, a, a, a one-cent piece of candy... Or you'd win a comic. And obviously this was a big, pardon the pun, money spinner for us. Um, but it brought people in. It got people talking about the comic. It got more people buying the comic. And the people who buy the comic read the comic. And they tend to like the comic. And so they feel good about the interaction. Whereas if I see the same thing at the, the DC or Marvel booth, I'm like, just do it for free, guys. You, people are already... People know who your character is. You don't have to do that bit. But I mean, then again, like I also, uh, at my last convention in New Zealand, I had a, um, I paid for like the top level Tinder profile, and I set up Blastosaurus with his own Tinder profile and sent a super like to everyone within a one mile radius, and so then everyone knew who Blastosaurus was before they got to the convention, <laughs> and they came across and there was a the big poster of his Tinder profile there, and people were like, "What? Why is why is this dinosaur hitting on me?" I'm like, "I don't know. Better buy the book and find out." <laughs> I like that. Just some unique marketing. You gotta do what you gotta do when you're indie, though. And the thing is, at the same time, like, I feel like that, like, I'm doing that. My sense of humor, if you if you respond to that marketing, you're responding to my sense of humor, you're going to like the thing I'm doing. Yep. If, you, if you're like, I don't want to date a dinosaur, cool, go elsewhere. I mean, you also don't have to date the dinosaur to read the book. I want to be clear about that. Um, he's very lonely, but you don't have to date him. He, he, he owns his own laundromat. Those, he those does. Are, they make bank. 
So, uh, so when can we expect uh, Cardboardia to be coming out? Do you guys have a firm date? Yeah, that is uh, September seventh, uh, paperback and and hardcover, and I think the ebook comes out at the same time. Um, I am going to go on record right now and say that there has been a printing error with it, and one page is missing the dialogue, and I, it's not my fault. I'm very upset about it. So anyone who gets it. Please email me, richard.fairgray at gmail.com. I will send you that page so that you can enjoy the story. Um, I'll send it to you digitally. I'm not posting the single page, but <laughs> I, I'm putting that, like, I'm going to put that out everywhere. But so, wants it. so they do a, a full print run and then figure this out afterwards? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I noticed it. A week and a half ago, and it's a curse. It's, it's actually, it has to be a curse at this point, because um, you've read my free comic book day, Blastosaurus, right? Yeah. We talked about this last I time. I think that's how we came in contact with you. Do you remember there's these two big double-page spreads with huge crowds, mm -hmm. all with blank word balloons? Yes. Yeah, that doesn't seem normal, does it? No, there was literally... A uh, one sentence story because the whole the premise of that book was like telling stories about things that Blastosaurus had done and people had helped. And I introduced a bunch of like, essentially, I did a clip show with new material. Mm -hmm. But uh, when and they were having this one year anniversary for Blasto's arrival in Freecast City, and every person at that party tells a one sentence complete story of a thing Blasto did. And it was the hardest thing in the world to write, just to come up with like I think there's like twenty eight one sentence stories in that book and and I don't know what happened because to remove that the guy formatting the books I didn't see it after it got put together but whoever did that part of it they had to like they had to turn off 28 layers that's not an accident it can't I don't know what was happening um and then uh, and like, if you're gonna do that, turn off the layer that is the word balloons as well, maybe, I don't know, just so that it doesn't look weird that there's empty word balloons, anyway, whatever. But then my free comic book day thing in 2020, uh, there's just one line of dialogue that's just magically been removed. No uh, idea why. Strange. I mean, <sighs> it just shows you how difficult and how much goes into each issue of a comic book. And everyone always asks for layered, layered Photoshop files or layered PDFs or whatever. I always send layered TIFFs because they're lossless and I like working in them. And then people get confused. I didn't know TIFFs could be layered. Well, they learn how to use a computer. <laughs> um, like I barely know how to use a computer, and I know that much. But yes, anyway. So somehow, somehow, one one page just has no dialogue, and it would be kind of fine. The first half of the page is very visual. He runs down the stairs, he tries to pour some cereal, his brother yanks away the cereal box, and we don't see that his magic token is inside it. That part would be fine. There's some super dope dialogue in there about missing dogs and how his family are kid detectives and they won't include him in their club. But the second half of the page is Bird, our main character, explaining that uh, the reason the dogs are going missing is not a mystery and that we do not need detectives to solve it. It's because... Uh, all the dogs that have gone missing have belonged to the same person, and she walks them off leash at the park. And there's a bacon factory just across the fridge, uh, fridge, bridge. And um, uh, when he says it, you see in the background this beautiful cartoon of like a bacon factory, which is just pigs on a conveyor belt falling into a big thing. <laughs> and like without dialogue, that's just crazy pants. <laughs> Especially for an all ages book. <laughs> like just a like like ten year old child looking really disapproving of his brother while describing pig murder, I guess. <laughs> but right. see, this is why so I've got you know, I've got those two books and then I'm doing uh I'm doing and I I can't announce it yet. I'm doing a book that is tentatively titled Four Color Heroes. It's a um YA uh teen romance uh, about comic books that I'm, I've been working on. I had the idea for it years ago, and I've been sort of keep pushing it back and pushing it back, and then I just had this big, like, revelation about um, it, it, a lot of it's about like, toxic religious ideals and toxic masculinity, and uh, I realized that I, I, can, I can pretty comfortably write about toxic masculinity, but I don't have a huge insight into, um, 
religion that wouldn't come across as like a 15 year old who's just discovered atheism railing against the system. <laughs> and then I realized that actually one of my main characters kind of is that. So maybe I just shifted the perspective right like, from his point of view so the religious stuff gets played down and he does react to it. I can write it honestly, but with some self deprecating you know, slant mm-hmm. to it so people can understand, like, yeah, you're seeing a 15 year old kid's viewpoint here. Um, so it's called Four Color Heroes. I can't say who it's with, but I've, 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 um, I haven't signed the deal yet, but it's, it's, it's with someone. And, um, when I got, uh, there was some delays on book two of Cardboardia, and so I had a few weeks off, and I wasn't sure what to do, so I started a new book called Haunted Hill, um, which is another thing that I've been, like, toying with for about nine months, and then I had this realization of, like, why am I trying to write this like a an adult cartoon? I should write this like a soap opera with a surrealist undertone. And so it's, like, it's my favorite thing I've ever done. Um, it's a, a, a 35-year-old woman who's just moved back to Hollywood, and she gets a... The whole first book is just, she gets a ride home because her Uber cancels on her. She gets a ride home with some people in their 20s. And when you get in the car with people in their 20s, a 10 minute drive turns into four hours because they stop for donuts and pick up a homeless guy and go to a trampoline park and like you never get where you're trying to go. And all their drama unfurls. And I think, I, I honestly think I could make this book go on for, for years. But uh, I did the first six issues in a month and a half, and it's like, wow. I'm, I'm so, I, it's, it's, I, I just got so into it. It's all, it's all done in, uh, it's black and white with all the ink wash and markers, and all the text is done by hand, and I wrote it in its six page chunks. So I, I kind of, I knew where the story was going, but I wanted it to feel like every time something happened, it would just be like, I had to make sure I was clear, like, in case I wanted to release it online one day, I wanted to make sure I had to do one chapter a week or something. Um, so it's six 18-page chapters, uh, and, and each chapter is three smaller chapters, really. Good. And it just it just follows this thing of, like, someone who's, who wants to be young and wants to keep up, but is a know-it-all and kind of unpleasant and also tired. Because it's like 11 o'clock at night. What are you people doing? Just take me home. I don't want to go see your friend's dumb stand-up show. Keep them busy, man. How do you... So we see all the time where books are late for this, that, or the other. And yet you just did six issues in less than a month? Like, oh, a month and a half. A month and a half. Okay. Well, still. That's still impressive. Like, Is that just is day and night that's what you do? <laughs> Yeah, I mean the thing is, I, there's it's there's not a lot of people who work full time in comics, mm-hmm. um, and the higher up you get, the more the more like it's weird. The better and more respected you get, the more people want to feel like they put their fingerprints on your work, and it slows everything down. You know, I, I had a I won't say which which book, but um, I sent off a synopsis for a script last August. Two page synopsis. And I got notes on that three weeks ago. Now, by the time they sent me the notes, I was like, oh, I, I'm sorry, I don't care about this anymore. I, I, like, I've forgotten everything that I wrote in that synopsis. Like, I can, I can refresh myself, I can get back into it, whatever. But I think, you know, when people say that, like, a first album is great and then the second one is their sophomore slump. Mm hmm. I think it's not because the musician got any worse, it's because they had to wait around and do stuff that, like, they had to keep waiting for approval because suddenly people realized they could make money from the stuff. And so everything had to be a little bit more, I don't know, just sanded down. That makes sense, because sophomore slump is a thing in a lot of creative industries. Mm. So I, I like that. I mean, I... I remember, and I'm, I'm not I'm not telling tales out of school here because pretty famously he went on record with this and it was everywhere for a minute, but um, Dylan Horrocks, when he was writing Batgirl, talked very openly on a panel about like what it actually felt like to write Batgirl and being in a room, and this is a long time ago, the comic industry has changed not nearly enough, but it has changed a bit since then because mm-hmm. there are, you know, things like 
women get to write comics now, just as a basic start. I mean, I know there were women writing comics, but, like, just not a lot, and more now, and we need, it, it, you know, that shift is and, in progress. And they're bigger names now. Yes, yeah. Like, we know who T.M. Mean, Howard is. We didn't know names back then. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and that's, you know, that is very rarely the fault of comic fans, and very rarely the fault of other comic writers. But when, when Dylan was talking about writing Batgirl, um, he said, you know, he found himself in this room at the Bat Summit where a group of dudes were, like, delighting in how, to, how they would torture this character. And that was, I mean, one, that was going to be the plan for the following year of the Batman titles. But two, it, you know, and so, so there was going to be like, it was going to take a long time to even do this. But two, the idea that everyone had to like kind of get together and have this discussion, it does take away from the honesty of saying like, here's, here's your, here's your pen and paper, go make a story. Like, yeah. writers, writers love to redraft. As a, as a, as someone who writes and draws my own stuff, like, Everything I write gets redrafted a couple of times, but the biggest redraft is when I'm actually drawing it, and I'll look at a page and just say, oh, I can tell a better visual story in that page, or I can t tweak this, you know, here, here, here. Like, th that redrafting happens and happens and happens, and as soon as you have to have someone approve every part of that, you lose that flow, you lose your connection with the characters, and everything takes longer to do. You know, I, I could make four books of Black Sand Beach a year if I was given... The, the rope to do it. Um, I wouldn't be able to make much else because those are 200 page books. But like, I, I can make a Black Sand Beach book in three months. I can make a Cardboardia book in three months. I can make Haunted Hill in a month and a half. Um, I just like, and, and which is why I'm now with multiple publishers and also still looking for more because I actually just need, I don't, I don't want to have to, you know, the, the only reason that I'm not self-publishing is because I just don't want to be in charge of that stuff. I want to be making, I want to be making the books, not, not putting them out in the world or overseeing printing. And then I take my eyes off the prize for a second and don't oversee the printing. And then three times in a row, I've got books with missing dialogue. So who knows? <laughs> well, yeah. And then you got to I'll, I'll just draw my books by hand and give them out on the side of the road. Let's do Xeroxes of them. Staple them together. I, I was once. <laughs> I was once at a uh, a an event, a lunch event of uh, with indie creators, and they'd all gotten to get together to meet uh, someone who's kind of a big name in the in the industry, and he's a very nice person. Uh, like he's pretty famously a pretty nice guy. Um. I'm just debating whether to say who it was. Yeah, it's harmless. It was, it was, it was Scott McCloud. He's a lovely Come. guy. Okay, and um, everyone was together to meet him. And I look over, and he's having a conversation with a man who says the words to him. Listen, what I don't understand is why you're wasting all your money making more than one copy of your book. You know, you're paying good money for the printing of these books. And I'm just stealing paper and pens, so it's free for me to just draw each new copy and give it to people. So, I'm sure Scott will be describing that to a <laughs> detective at some point. Um, but, you know, the, 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 there is some weird truth to it. You know, like, I love comic books. I yeah. love the fact that I can talk to someone who's a hundred or someone who's ten and they're all going to know who Batman is and they're all going to have a favorite Batman story and they can share that with each other. It creates these links across generations and across the world. And again, I don't want to write Batman. Um, but, you know, there are people out there who've, who've said to me things like, wouldn't it be better if we all just hung out in small tribes and made our art and shared it with each other? And, I don't know. I don't want to do it, but maybe it would overall. Maybe it would be a better thing. That, because we do a lot with uh, Kickstarter creators, that to me is kind of a little bit bigger version of what you're saying is Kickstarter. I mean, you're right. Like, like accidentally, the internet is is creating that that space, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's like because I feel like the internet is heading in this direction where right now we're all worried about the millions of likes and the millions of followers and all of that. But like, as we start to realize things and you listen to people way smarter than me, you only need a couple thousand and you Mm. can really have, like you can do something with your art or whatever you're doing, whether it's podcasts, comics, whatever. And that seems to be what Kickstarter is doing is I'll see the biggest Kickstarters out there only really getting a couple thousand people. Well, it's, it's, they're only getting like, they'll make their money, but it's, it's a dwindling number of people every time. And I think that's kind of okay. Like, like for a long time, I thought that wasn't, I thought it was like, oh, your you know, your mom's buying your book, but it's not that at all. Like I've been wrong about that. It's, it's, it's that, oh, these are the people who just keep coming back. Yeah, I know a lot of guys that do it, and it's there's different things, you know, mailing lists and all that crap that you can do to grow your audience and all that. But when it really comes down to it, they they'll have a couple hundred. I think the biggest guy I know does like three hundred that come back for every single book, but they're always funded, at least for the funding yeah. goal they put in place, and. I'm not saying they're rich. I'm not saying that they're, you know, making great money off of it, but they keep making their books. So, but at the same time, and I, I have a feeling you and I might be talking about the same person. Um, at the same time, they spend so much of their energy on that part of it that I, I don't know how they're. I haven't. I haven't read this. I've read. I've read some of their. Does, does the person we're talking about do books and novels? No. I, I mean, I'm talking about multiple okay. people. I talk to a lot of Kickstarter okay. creators that are comic book creators. Oh, just just when you said that the yeah. person with the 300, I was. I was just. I, I. I think we we know enough people in common that I sort of. I'm. I'm being very careful because I'm not trying to crap on anyone here. I'm <laughs> just. Uh, like there are people I know who are so focused on doing Kickstarters that I know their books are not very good. Mm-hmm. Like, and this is not universal to Kickstarter at all, by any means. There are many very good books on Kickstarter. I've discovered some amazing things on there. But I know a couple of people where I look at their stuff and I'm like, I'm going to keep supporting you. Your books aren't very good. Oh, you're doing another Kickstarter? Maybe, maybe just redraft the book first. Maybe, like, you made some money, take some time get better at, like, you're really good at Kickstarter now. Maybe focus on the book part for just a second. It just, it, like, I feel like the balance is getting off with, with it, 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 sometimes with this. There's a part this of is, that. This is making me sound very anti-Kickstarter. I'm not. I, I'm a big supporter of it. But there's, people can get really hung up. And it's because, like, I mean, I do the same thing. Like, I, my, my, I got told, like, you'll get better advances from publishers if you have more followers on Instagram. And so I've gone from like 500 to 5,000 in the past eight months. And yes, my advances from publishers doubled and that's cool. But I also know that the past eight months I've spent way too much time like freaking out about like, oh, I lost three followers today. Oh, I only gained this many. Oh no. And like having to like keep track of all of it. it I feel gross and I'm not making good work while I do that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say some of them, the ones I know, will even tell you that, like, when a book is done and a campaign is done and they collect their funds, then they spend the next couple of weeks working their, because most of them work day jobs too, working their asses off to then separate books in the piles, get the shipping labels done, do because they're doing all that themselves. So, yeah. that, I mean... If you don't want to do all that, it's not a good way to go. But if you think you can only foster a small, or you're building your way up to being someone who can go to a publisher at some point, it's not a bad way yeah. to get some some work out there. Certainly, and I, I, I really want to know. I I don't know anyone who's gone from Kickstarter to to a larger publisher. I'm sure there are, but I I don't know anyone who's who's done that. Um, that's not true. I know someone who literally announced they'd done that last week. So my point is is stupid, but I'm going to make it anyway. 
There are, there are very few people who, have, who I think have done that. And I think that now that big publishers are getting into the Kickstarter market as well, that seems like... Now, you know what? You guys should be here to find new talent. You shouldn't be here to, you know, get Keanu Reeves' book out there. It's yeah. Like a dick move. Yeah, I got... So, I'm a bit hypocritical on this, because, like, I don't mind when certain... I don't mind when somebody goes to Kickstarter that could, like yourself, just go to a publisher. Like, that's fine if you want to take complete creative control of your book. I understand that. I do yeah. kind of have a problem when you're... And I like the guy's work, so I'm not shitting on him, but I do kind of have a problem when you're Scott Snyder, who's publishing a book through Image, but for some reason he went to Kickstarter to do a limited edition version of the hmm. book. Like, I feel like you're taking away from a market that could go to smaller creators. And yeah, like you said, the Berserker thing too with Keanu Reeves' book. Like, why did that need to go to... You knew that was going to sell a ton of copies. Yeah. They, like, they used Kickstarter to get themselves advertising. Yeah. And I, I just, I mean, I guess do whatever you got to do. Like, it's also, we're still talking about comics here. We're still talking about, like, the pimple on the ass of the movie industry. We're tiny. We know what we are. Like, I said in an interview the other day, like, I'm just trying to be a better version of human garbage every day. And I mean it. Like, like we are the absolute bottom of the ladder. We create the things that other people make a lot more money off later on at higher levels. So... I don't know if, if if any company, if any comic company wants to go to kick, like just use whatever you have. Just let's just keep comics going. I guess we we've had a tough year. I don't know if you know this. It's been a tough year. Yeah, and uh, we'll circle that back around to uh, kind of close this off. But speaking of getting more people in the books, I mean, I Richard, I love your work. I'm actually really excited about this Cardboardia book. I'm probably gonna buy a couple so I can give them the kids. But I also love nice. that you're doing. All ages stuff, and you said one of them's you know, a young adult, but still all ages, and that's another thing we need more of in this industry. We do. I mean, and like I create, I, 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 I mean, there's a lot of good all ages stuff out there. I create stuff that wasn't around when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. There, I look at stuff now and I think, oh man, I wish that it existed when I was growing up. I would have loved that, and and it, you know, it just didn't. I, I was so excited when, like, when I when I first saw an ad for a uh, Goosebumps book in the, the school book orders, I cut the ad out and kept it under my pillow because I was just so excited that it was a horror story for someone my age. There, it, it didn't exist. Like, I'm creating I'm creating books. Like, they're clever. They're challenging. There's some heavy emotional messaging and some heavy... I mean, there's there's some light political messaging in there. there there's all kinds of stuff in there. And it's about kids who are incredibly competent and doing amazing things and having adventures. And I, I, it's... Sometimes it's scary, but I, I know that 8 to 12-year-old Richard would have loved it. Yeah. Uh, we got to be around the same age because I remember Goosebumps, too. And, and he, like, as a kid, like, you don't want to be – when you get to that age, like you said, 8 to 12 and even 13 and so on, you don't want to be talked down to anymore. Mm. So having a complex story is important, but, Yeah. So <laughs> when I was when I was uh, when I was four years old, my local toy store was going out of business, and I asked my grandmother, who was a uh, well-known local racist, uh, why this had happened, and she said it's because all of the toys are being made by foreigners, and the toy stores can't compete. And it was coming up to Christmas, and I interpreted this to mean, oh, like Santa's elves. So. <laughs> I was like, let's go to the mall. I want to meet Santa and give him a very serious talking to. <laughs> and I did not get a photograph of Santa that day because he got, like, he didn't know how to really deal with that assault from a child. That's a strange one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kid, like, so, no kid of any age wants to be talked down to. No. And you shouldn't do it. Like, like I love asking kids questions because I'll just be like, you know, they'll, they'll give me the answers that I would never have possibly thought of. I'm like, hey, what are you, what are you? I, I, I said to a kid, when I, back when I was in New Zealand last year for a, for a minute and a half, um, I met my friend's kid who's like three years old. And I was like, I was like, your life seems pretty easy. What do you worry about? And she said, if all the dinosaurs in other countries jump at the same time, the earth might break. 
I was like, well, what about the dinosaurs in this country? And she's like, I've never met a dinosaur. I don't think we have any. And then just looked really sad about it. Uh, yeah, a kid will... Some of the things that comes out of him. So, Richard, we could, yeah, we could go on. Fact, he's going to have some erotic issues later, but that's fine. <laughs> we could go on for probably another two hours, but uh, we got to yeah, wrap okay, it up. We, we, so, we got to wrap this up. I got to <laughs> So, uh, Richard, where can, people, where can people find the new Black Sand Beach first off? And then uh, where can they follow you online if they want to do so? So, Black Sand Beach 1 and 2 are available on bookshop.org or if you're outside the U.S., Amazon. Um, or at your local bookstore, anywhere you, you know, anywhere you get books. Don't support Amazon. They're evil. We all have to because we're stuck. But don't do it if you can avoid it. Um, political rant. Uh, and uh, you can pre-order Carbordia anywhere you like now. Um, and uh, Blastosaurus is still available. Um, my website is richardfairgray.com. My Instagram, which is the best place to keep up with me, is Richard Fairgray Author. I'm the only Richard Fairgray in the entire world, so I'm like super duper easy to track down. And um, yeah, I promise to have at least a few more new things out before the end of the year. I think I might do a horror anthology. I'm not. Oh, oh, my, the, the horror anthology that my corn cob story that we talked about in the last episode. Yes. That is, uh, it's, 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 the Kickstarter succeeded. It's printed. It's, it's going to be available at like as soon as cons are back on, I guess. And maybe it'll be in stores soon. I know that I'm like. <laughs> I'm, I'm meeting up with the publisher next week to pick up my advanced copies. So, so yeah, uh, it's called Nightmare Theater, and it has, like, the, the grossest story I've ever written. And all your stuff is also available through Diamond as well, right? Yes, yes. Everything everything is through Diamond. Um, and if you if you have very young children, um, go online and buy my, my picture books. Um, uh, the one everyone likes the most, because they know it the most, is Gorillas in Our Midst. And uh, my grandpa is a dinosaur, but also Sweet Penny and the Lion. If you want to write, read a book to kids about how girls should learn to well, girls 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 shouldn't be taught to be quiet and good. They should speak up and not get eaten by lions. Solid advice. So mm -hmm. hey, Richard. Don't get eaten by lions. <laughs> Thanks so much for taking some time talking to me, man. Um, we'll Thanks. have to do it again soon. And uh, I do. I look forward to reading Carbordia. Awesome. Thanks.